Welcome to the Healthcare Triage Podcast. This episode was super interesting and long, and therefore, I'm going to skip right past the news. If you're interested, go watch this week's Healthcare Triage news. Otherwise, let's jump right in. Our guest this week is Dr. Jonathan Friedel, a good friend of mine and also a transplant surgeon here at Indiana University School of Medicine. So I'm going to let him introduce himself first, and then I'm going to ask him lots of questions. Hi, this is uh, Jonathan Friedel. I'm a uh... Chief of Transplant at Indiana University. I mainly specialize in pancreas transplants, but I'm kind of a jack of all trades. I do livers and uh, bowels and uh, used to do kidneys. Uh, I'm originally from Montreal, and I've been in Indiana now since 2002. So how do you get to be a transplant surgeon? So clearly, you went to college first and then medical school. Where'd you go to medical school? I went to medical school in Montreal. And then what did you do after that? So um, the... um, Training in Montreal is a little bit different because uh, they have a different schooling system. Um, so uh, instead of going to grade 11, 12 and 13, high school actually goes to grade 11, then we do two years of college. Mm. Um, after that, I went to an early acceptance program at McGill for medical school. Following medical school, it's a five-year general surgery training for residency. There was an opportunity to spend extra time in the lab, and I took advantage of that. I did two years. And then following that, it's a two-year fellowship in transplantation. And after that, you go look for work. So to become a uh, pancreas transplant surgeon, is there any extra training to specialize there, or is that just part of the general transplant fellowship? So in order to become a pancreas transplant surgeon specifically, uh, most people go through training for multiple organs, and uh, the program you train at has to have a certain number of pancreas transplants that they perform a year uh, so that their fellows get enough experience they can start. How do you know you want to be a pancreas transplant surgeon? Well, I didn't originally want to be a pancreas transplant surgeon. I think uh, originally I wanted to do livers and intestines, and I really was interested in pediatric livers. And what ended up happening is when I came to Indiana, I noticed that, like many other programs, they would only do pancreas transplants when there was an ideal offer with an ideal recipient. And I sort of felt like there was a lot of organs here that were going to waste or were being sent out to other programs. And I originally became interested as an attending because I wanted wanted to not waste those organs. All right, so let's back up for a second. Can you explain what a pancreas does? Sure. Uh, pancreas is an organ in the uh, upper abdomen. Uh, it lives in the back of the belly. Um, it's an organ that participates in digestion, and it also participates in uh, the uh, endocrine system. And the part we're interested for pancreas transplantation is the endocrine part. Uh, pancreas makes insulin and glucagon and somatostatin and a bunch of other hormones, particularly of interest as diabetes happens when you don't make enough insulin. Uh, so we transplant a pancreas so that we make people who don't make insulin make insulin. So a a pancreas transplant effectively would cure type 1 diabetes. Um, It's sort of like an ideal treatment for it. Why don't we do it for everyone then? That's a great question. Actually, the most common consults we get are patients that are well-controlled diabetics and uh, they're sort of looking down the line and they're worried they're going to lose their vision or they develop neuropathy or kidney problems and they want to just get a pancreas. But the balancing act is you take a person who's taking lifelong medications and at risk for chronic diseases, you do a big operation, first of all, and second of all, you put them on immunosuppression medications for the rest of their life. Um, So instead of being a diabetic patient, they become a transplant patient. Patient, and it's not really worth that risk unless there's something else that tilts the balance. By far the most common reason to do a pancreas transplant is that they're already going to get a kidney transplant for diabetes-related kidney disease. So you might as well also put in a pancreas so they won't be diabetic. And basically, you've taken all the risk of the immunosuppression off the table because they've already committed to lifelong immunosuppression for the kidney transplant. So it's, it's like a plus one operation. Like as long as you're getting another kind of transplant, we might as well fix this at the same time. Uh, And well, first of all, the patient survival is better if you get both organs. Hmm. And the survival on the waiting list for patients who are uh, diabetic and have kidney failure is amongst the highest. So this is a really at-risk patient population with a huge benefit. Um, So it's it's not decorative. But um, there are also patients that have life-threatening complications from their diabetes. In fact, in patients like that, we would do a pancreas without a kidney. Uh, The most common of those is hypoglycemia and awareness. Uh, Those would be patients that have low sugars. They don't get any warning signs. Um, So they first find out that their sugar is low when they wake up on the floor. Somebody has to revive them. Somebody has to give them something sweet. Frequently emergency room visits, EMT calls, and hospital admissions for this. So I'm, I'm sort of fascinated. How do they fix the timing 
I imagine if we're going to do it with a kidney transplant, then we have to either have some kind of aligning of the stars that a kidney is available at the same moment a pancreas is available, or is it something that if they've already had a previous kidney transplant and they're therefore on immunosuppression, later we can do a pancreas transplant? So that, that's a complicated question because we could do either of those. Um, frankly, when I see a patient who needs a kidney and a pancreas, like all regular kidney patients, I ask them if they have a living donor. And it is possible to get a kidney first and then follow that with a pancreas at a later date. Uh, much more common is to perform both organs from the same organ donor. Hmm. Pancreas graft survival is slightly better, but the waiting time is longer. And there's all kinds of pluses and minuses for that. Uh, but um, the way the allocation works in the country, um, if you are listed for a kidney pancreas and your pancreas number comes up, then the kidney travels with it. Okay. So let's, I want to talk a bit about when we say travels with it, exactly what happens, because I'll, I'll say this, and I, uh, when doing these kinds of talks, especially with people who are friends, I sometimes reveal some information. I don't think you'll be embarrassed by this, but you've canceled on us more times for dinner than probably any other friend I have in the sense that like you clearly are on call, it feels like almost 24-7. Um, you're the closest in my experience of what I felt like my father was as a, as a trauma surgeon had, where at any moment, clearly the bell could go off and, and you have to go because that's when an organ appears. So could you walk us through what happens when that you get that page? How do you get notified and what is the first step that you do? So it's, it's not really done as an emergency, so I don't get a phone call, drop what I'm doing and leave. Um, and it's not done as an elective case unless it's a living donor for a kidney transplant. Um, the reality is that we'll get an organ offer that we'll accept and they won't go to the operating room to procure that particular organ until some 12 to 48 hours after the time we get that notification and accept the organ. Um, so we know that the organ's coming down the pipeline, but there's very little control of our life after that. So I would want to ask you some further details about that. One, what does it mean to accept the organ and how do you do that? Let's start there. Okay. So currently, the way the organs are offered is through a system called DonorNet. This is a national system uh, where they send out offers. You look at the offer electronically, and you make a decision if you would like to accept it or not. Uh, we have a partnership with Indiana Donor Network, and they communicate that information to us. Um, once you look at that and you decide if that organ is appropriate for transplant and it's appropriate for your recipient, you say yes or you say no. Um, how, do you, how do you decide that? Like, what are the how? Well, how do you decide that? Well, it's probably the most important thing for an organ is how it actually looks when you go to procure it. And so, most of what you do with the offer you get is decide if you're going to go and look at it. Um, so, for example, if it's a person in their twenties and they're lean and they're healthy and they have an isolated head injury of some sort, um, then that's going to be an ideal donor. Mm -hmm. uh, where it starts to get a little bit fuzzy is when you get to the extremes of age, or if right. you get to the extremes of body mass index, or or on the other scale, if it might be very small, um, you look at the labs, you look at the CAT scans, the mechanism of injury, or if the person had a stroke, whether they have vascular disease, uh, you take some of their social history into account. Uh, nowadays, we have a lot of organ donors from IV drug abuse, for instance, mm -hmm. and other high-risk behaviors. And so we screen all of our donors for uh, the typical viruses, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, uh, but certain people fit into high-risk categories. And we use those organs, but we have to put a little bit more thought into them. So... Do these organs come from all over the country or are they geographically separated? So, uh, you know, separates their offers into local, regional, national. Um, local for us, we have uh, our OPO, our organ procurement organization, mm -hmm. is the center that makes the offers. Uh, captures all of Indiana or the majority of Indiana. Um, and uh, currently in Indiana, they have uh, our program and there's uh, two other programs that do kidney transplants and one of them that does some pancreas. And then after that, it goes to regional. For us, the region would be region 10. Okay. And that would be Ohio and Michigan in addition to us. And then after that, they go national. And for some organs, they tend to be uh, shared regionally, uh, but mostly go locally. Uh, some organs, we get offers from all around the country. Okay. So you've now decided to accept the organ. What happens next? Well, after you've accepted the organ, uh, we call the recipient in. A uh, majority of cases, we'll send out a team to go procure the organs. Um, and um, What does that mean? To go do the organ retrieval operation means to uh, go out there. The, the person is... Most of the cases, the person is brain dead, which is a legal definition and a medical definition, which means their heart's still beating and they've got a ventilator pushing air through them and oxygen through them, but they are basically disconnected from their brain. They will never have an independent thought. They will never take a breath. Right. 
Um, so basically the organs are all getting blood flow until we go to get the organs. We do an operation to uh, prepare the organs as much as possible, but ultimately what we're trying to do is flush them all out with preservation solution, take them out safely and put them in packages with ice. So who goes and how do they go? Different programs have different philosophies. Uh, our program almost always sends out an attending with a trainee, a fellow, uh, to go and retrieve the organs. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's an attending surgeon and a, like a resident or a fellow. Yeah. It's a, a transplant surgeon from our team and usually a fellow, sometimes a resident. Anyone else, nurses, anything else, or is it just usually the two surgeons? Um, we have perfusionists that go with the team. Those are the people that would take the kidneys and put them on pumps. We we currently pump all of our kidneys in Indiana. Many programs do it for many of their kidneys. We do it for all of our kidneys. Um, that's a system that basically constantly perfuses preservation solution through the kidneys. And do you drive or fly or? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Anything that'll be longer than an hour drive will usually fly because we're always trying to minimize the amount of time the organs are out of the body, so the ischemic time. And so then do you have to really get almost like a charter jet? Actually, Indiana Donor Network owns two jets that okay. they, they control and they actually hire out to other OPOs. Um, in addition to that, if our planes are all busy, then we start chartering flights. So you wouldn't fly on commercial and like wait for your flight or hope that no. You know, like there was it. a time a lot of kidneys used to travel by commercial. Um, I think many of them still do. Uh, for livers, that's almost never. Uh, for intestines, that's almost never. And for pancreas, we tend to treat them like livers here. Mm -hmm. uh, some programs still use commercial flights. So you go, you fly, you get there, you do, you're doing the operation, you remove, do you remove the pancreas and the kidney or do you have to bring two different kinds of transplant surgeons? Well, they take, uh, they take out everything. We would usually send one surgeon to take out all the organs. Mm -hmm. so they take out the liver and the pancreas and the kidneys or the liver and the kidneys or the liver, the pancreas, the intestine, the right. kidneys. There's usually a separate team for the thoracic organs. Um, some chest, we should say. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, heart and lungs. Right. Um, sometimes there's uh, teams that are splitting livers, so they can use one liver for two recipients. It's not unusual for there to be different teams for that. Mm. Um, sometimes we will have a team for the liver, a team for the pancreas, a team for the intestine. It all depends on the donor. And so what, what do they do with the organs after that? Um, they package them in preservation solution to keep them until they're transplanted. They put them in ice and they transport them to the recipient hospital. And so you then fly home with them. And so how long do you think there is usually between you've harvested the organs and now you're you need to put them into to somebody else? For most of the organs that we transplant, so liver, pancreas, and intestine, um, as soon as we get back to the hospital, we're working on the uh, back table preparation of the organs. That's literally a table in the back of the room uh, where we prepare the organs and get them ready so that all we have to do is sew the blood vessels. Um, frequently, there's a separate team that starts the operation on the recipient. So so is it as easy as attaching artery, you know, the blood vessels and off you go? I'll use a kidney transplant as an example because that's probably the most straightforward anatomically because there's a single artery going into it and a single vein coming out. Essentially, we expose the blood vessels in the recipient. Uh, for a kidney transplant, we use the uh, iliac artery and vein. And so there's uh, an artery going into the kidney and a vein coming out of the kidney. And we attach the vein going out of the kidney to the vein in the recipient. Then we attach the artery going into the kidney to the artery in the recipient. So when we take off the clamps, blood runs toward the leg, up through the kidney, back through the vein, and draining the leg. So there's no need to attach sort of nerves or anything else? Just to blood well, there's no nerves, but for almost every organ, there's some kind of drainage required. So for the kidney, there's the ureter mm -hmm. uh, that has to be sewn to the recipient's bladder. Uh, for a pancreas transplant, uh, you know, the pancreas has an exocrine function yep. that helps you digest food, so it makes fluid uh, that usually drains into the duodenum, which is the first part of the intestine. So we actually bring back the duodenum from the organ donor and we attach that to the intestine of the recipient. Uh, for bowel transplants, you have to reestablish re the continuity of the intestine. Uh, and for liver transplants, there's the bile duct. How common are intestinal transplants? They're not very common. There's uh, only a handful of programs in the country that perform them. A big program is a program that does probably about 20. What's the disease that leads to an intestinal transplant? The most common indication for an intestine transplant um, is uh, gut failure, so short gut, mm -hmm. uh, usually from resection, but occasionally for functional reasons, uh, like people have pseudo obstruction. Um, very common to perform a combination of a liver and a pancreas and intestine all together. Yeah, that's like the whole, okay. It's, yeah. just, it's like just swapping it all out. Okay. Well, the, the pictures are phenomenal yeah. when you have a, if you can catch a photograph when all of the organs are out of the belly, it is very impressive. But that's usually for patients that have TPN and do 
used injury for mm-hmm. a long time, uh, short gut failure. Uh, here we do quite a few uh, multivisceral transplants for patients who need a liver, but the entire portal mesenteric venous system, all the veins draining the intestine and the pancreas are all clotted off. Uh, that's become less common, but we have done quite a few for that. Uh, we've also done it for some centrally located, slow-growing tumors like neuroendocrine tumors, where you can't get everything out, so you take out everything and give a new everything. How do they decide who gets an organ? So that's sort of an open-ended question. In all cases, it's some kind of end-stage organ failure um, that's not going to recover. Um, so for kidney transplant patients, when they have enough kidney damage that their kidney function reaches below a certain threshold, that's less than a creatinine clearance of 20, uh, or that they're on dialysis, then we can put in an organ and fix that by making them start making urine again. For a pancreas transplant, this is a bit of a gray area because we used to say the person had to be a type 1 diabetic that either needed another organ transplant, usually a kidney, or they had life-threatening complications from their diabetes. But more and more, we're doing pancreas transplants for some type 2 diabetics. Hmm. So why would you do pancreas transplants more for type 1 than type 2 diabetes? Pancreas transplantation has been around for a little bit over 50 years. And the philosophy of pancreas transplants was very similar to the philosophy of kidney transplants. We do a kidney transplant because someone doesn't make enough urine. And so if you put in a kidney, and it's a heterotopic graft, which means we don't take out their old kidneys, we just add a new one. If you put one in that's making urine, then you fix the problem. So the logic for pancreas transplants was identical. It was if they're not making insulin, we don't take out their old pancreas. It's still doing lots of good things. But we add one pancreas that's making insulin, and now they're not diabetic anymore. And I think that we felt for years that you was specific to the type 1 diabetics because they weren't making insulin. The mechanism for type 2 diabetes is that they are resistant to their insulin, but they are making it. So people didn't think it would work. Um, Very recently, people have been embracing it and doing it more and more. I think the definition of type 2 diabetes is a little bit loose. I think the way we're defining it is uh, C-peptide positive. Uh, C-peptide is a little protein that you make with insulin that gets cleaved off, um, and you can measure the level in the blood. So if you want to know if somebody is making insulin rather than injecting insulin, injected insulin doesn't have C-peptides. You measure C-peptide level, and you know whether or not they're making insulin. So I think they started off by doing C-peptide positive people that looked like type 1 diabetics based on their age of diagnosis and their body habitus and other things. And then gradually when they realized that that worked, they started applying it to type 2 diabetics And more and more we're doing type 2 diabetics that aren't requiring a lot of insulin that also need a pancreas transplant. Um, So the reason that we're doing way more type 1s is that everybody's comfortable with that and people are just beginning to embrace type 2. Well, I got to be honest, even just in my head, it's hard to wrap around the idea that why it would work as much for type 2 diabetes because it just seems like insulin resistance, again, yeah, would be the major problem. So giving them more insulin, I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, but if you consider what the typical treatment is for a type 2 diabetic, some people will be diet controlled, some of them will be pill controlled, but ultimately we end up putting them on insulin when that doesn't work and we do get them under control. For liver transplant, uh, cirrhosis is irreversible. Uh, When somebody develops cirrhosis, you can start talking about it, Um, but usually they have to start developing some complications from their cirrhosis, usually related to the portal hypertension. So patients develop encephalopathy and ascites and things like that. And for livers, we have a special scoring system that tells you how sick the person is and their likelihood of dying from their liver disease. So we actually triage patients for their liver transplants based on this scoring system. So, but clearly in the United States, I think we still, we have more people who probably could get transplants than we have organs available. How do they decide which person, once they have one of those issues, gets the the organ versus another person who has those issues? So, uh, UNOS is the United Network for Organ Sharing. That's a uh, government-sponsored group. Um, that has buy-in from volunteers from all around the country, all types of organ transplants and from the public in general. And they have a team set up for every type of organ that we transplant. And that's their main mission is to figure things like that out. For liver transplants, they've been trying to optimize the patients dying from liver disease on wait lists. Mm -hmm. Um, So they would want the sickest patients on the list to get those organs. Currently, they're looking at geographic disparities for that and trying to optimize that. For kidneys, um, they would like for kidneys that have the potential to last for decades to go into recipients that will as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, So they've recently changed their allocation to make that more suitable. For pancreas transplants, it's 
you know, more based on wait time than anything else, which uh, I've always thought was a very fair system. But the more I do this, the more I realize that certain patients have urgent need. And certainly if somebody comes in and they immediately need an organ transplant, we do have systems to give them high priority on the list. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a, a somebody, I'm, I'm sure, you know, ethical ethicists have been involved and in, because in, it just seems like one of those issues where it's like, there's no perfect answer that they have to find some kind of ordering system, but it's going to make somebody upset. That, that's a very common ethical dilemma is you have one organ and who do you put it into? Right. And, and sometimes you do get into them locally when you're actually looking at the patients and trying to decide what you're going to do with an organ. You have two people to qualify. And usually the easiest thing is to default to whatever the list is because so much thought has gone into the allocation system. Can you split a pancreas or is that a one-to-one -one? You can, and it has been done. Currently, the number of pancreas transplants we're doing in the country have been dwindling. Mm -hmm. uh, there still are a lot of them being performed. The numbers have gone up in the last couple of years, but if you look at the trend over the last decade and a half, the numbers have gone down substantially, uh, which means from my perspective, if there's patients on the list, they're likely going to get transplanted within a reasonable period of time, and it's probably not worth the extra technical exercise and potential complications of splitting one in half. Why is that? Why have the numbers been going down? We, we don't have a very good reason. I think that the quality of the donors have certainly changed. Some of it is practice. I think, um, you know, pancreas transplants is complicated and it takes an awful lot of effort to get it right. Uh, so I think that we have become a little bit conservative in the choices we're making and the organs that we'll accept. Um, I think we're listing fewer patients. Some of it has to be the effect of better control for diabetes. Mm. Um, so certainly with pump technologies and continuous glucometers and, you know, the potential for those two to communicate, um, there are f probably fewer patients that are getting towards renal failure from this and fewer patients that have the uh, life-threatening diabetes complications we were talking about. But it's really hard to put a finger on which exactly caused all this. When we weigh the long-term potential complications for immunosuppression versus type 1 diabetes, um, I mean, I clearly know the complications of type 1 diabetes. Um, and I actually feel like I know some of the complications from immunosuppression, but it's, uh, I'm not like in my head, I'm like, would, would, would the immunosuppression be worse? Is it? It, it certainly can be. Uh, most patients tolerate immunosuppression very well, or I, I don't think we would do this. Um, you right. know. But the, the main toxicities of the immunosuppression are that uh, they affect kidney function, which is mm. sort of ironic that we're doing a kidney transplant right. and putting them on a nephrotoxic medication. Uh, but that's why they have to have their levels monitored for years. Uh, some of them are neurotoxic, but much more importantly is the opportunistic infections and cancers. Um, and they, they aren't as selective as diabetes. Diabetes kind of takes years and it depends on how you control your diabetes, and then you see what happens. But we will have bizarre things happen with immunosuppression, like graft versus host disease, and like post transplant lymphoproliferative right. disorder, which is a type of lymphoma. And um, it's it's these weird complications that'll just pick a patient that make it kind of frustrating. And every patient needs to be warned that immunosuppression is not without risk. And these are all very uncommon complications, but you know when you see them happen, you kind of wonder why it picked this particular person. So do all of the organs stay in or do you take some out and get rid of them? The terminology we use is heterotopic or orthotopic. Um, and so in some cases, the sick organ is in a place where it's causing the problem. Um, so hearts and livers, um, so a liver that's cirrhotic, the main reason patients are having a problem isn't the cirrhotic liver, although some of it is that they're not making the proteins they need to make. The, most of the problems come from the portal hypertension, so the back pressure on the blood vessels feeding into the liver that lead to varices in the esophagus and lead to ascites. Um, so we literally have to remove the liver and put in a new one in the exact same place to fix all of the pressures in the blood vessels. Uh, for other organs where they aren't making something they're supposed to make, like urine or insulin, uh, we don't need to take out the original organ. We could just add an extra one. As long as they're making what they need to make, they'll be fixed. It seems like I, I can I can picture finding room for a kidney or a pancreas in the body, but I'm having a harder time wrapping around the idea that you could squeeze an extra liver in there. It yeah. Just well, that's, that's why we do take out the old one and replace it. And um, I don't know about other programs. We actually uh, spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out if livers are going to fit. Um, so we do look at the body habitus of the donors. But nowadays, everybody gets CT scans. Uh, and there's so many good mechanisms for sharing CT scans that we can usually predict based on the size of the liver and the size of the recipient's liver and abdominal cavity that we're going to be okay for size. Hmm. 
And I imagine for gut transplants, the the old gut is either gone or has to come out. Uh, the bigger problem is that if it's already been removed, we do lose a lot of terrain because ah, things tend to contract down. Right. Uh, so sometimes a very big person that's had everything removed doesn't have a lot of room in their belly and we have to put in smaller donors' organs into them. Hmm. Can people donate a pancreas if they're if they choose to? So, I mean, alive, I guess. I'm asking, I was like, my, my brother needs a pancreas. Can I give him half my pancreas? So it's it's technically possible to do it. Um, there's an experience in living donor pancreas transplant at uh, University of Minnesota and uh, in parts of Asia where they don't believe in brain death, uh, where they've embraced living donor. Uh, most often what they would do is a laparoscopic donor nephrectomy and distal pancreatectomy, and they would transplant just the tail. Uh, and then they would usually drain it into the bladder. Um, it's it's possible to do that, but in our country, even at University of Minnesota, where they have a history of having done this, most people get transplanted with cadaveric organ donors. Can you? Can is anyone working on an artificial pancreas? It's not the way you're picturing it. You know, where you sort of picture this little robotic fish-shaped item that you put in the back of your belly. Uh, but they actually use that terminology to describe the insulin pump that has a closed-loop right. communication with the uh, glucometer. Um, so it's an external device um, that looks like the insulin pump and a glucometer, uh, but it's a computer programming that makes it challenging. And I think a lot of these pumps have insulin and glucagon in them. This has always baffled me because it seems like one of those things where it, we should be able to do it because uh, we're just we're just saying like check the blood sugar, give them insulin, you know, monitor. Like this is we know what the pancreas is doing. We know how to do the reading. We know how to deliver it. I, I've never been able to figure out like why we can't tackle that issue. But it, clearly, people have been working on it for a long time with with not a lot of success. Yeah, well, they actually do have the first FDA approved um, uh, pancreas like this, uh, where it's external and the devices communicate. And the reason that it took a long time to reach this point is that um, people who had a tendency to hypoglycemia and who had unawareness, they would overshoot their target and end up with low sugars. Mm -hmm. Now, the newer pumps that have glucagon, that's less of a problem. Just a little bit of a waiver. I'm, I'm not an endocrinologist, right. but I, I do see all the technologies that my patients patients come in with when they're looking for a pancreas transplant. And usually the ones that are seeing us are the ones that have failed pump technology. I just, my, my K award from back in like 2003 was about mobile technology for adolescent diabetes management. And I remember multiple people telling me at the time, don't even bother with this because this was going to be here any second now and we'd have diabetes solved. And of course it's 15 years later and I'm like, well, no. So I'm, I'm always amazed that like, this always seems like it's right there, but we just can't, we can't seem to get it. Yeah. In, in addition to the pump technologies, I mean, there's all kinds of other sciences that are being explored. Uh, certainly, islet cell transplantation is is close to being a uh, clinical reality. Uh, currently, it's mostly done under study protocol. Um, doesn't quite have the longevity of a pancreas transplant, but you remove all of the morbidity of the pancreas transplant operation. Can you go into more detail with what that is? What's an islet cell transplant? Um, that's where they digest a pancreas with enzymes and they ultimately bring it down to the point where they literally have the uh, islets of Langerhan isolated. Right. Islets of Langerhans are? Uh, the part of the pancreas that secretes the hormones. Okay. Uh, so specifically insulin in this case. And uh, the most common way to uh, put them into the recipient is they're injected into the portal venous system where they embolize into the liver and they start making insulin. And that could be done uh, either surgically or done percutaneously by interventional radiologists. They literally stick a needle into the liver, into the portal venous system. And then as they come out, they plug the hole that they made. Do all of the donors or all of the donors technically brain dead or how else might that work? Well, we, we do living donors for certain organs. Um, so kidneys, it, it would be our preference to do a living donor kidney. Uh, more and more programs are starting to do living donors for liver transplants. Uh, and they could do either the left side for pediatrics or they can actually take the right side for an adult. Um, in addition to the living donors, a uh, vast majority of our donors are deceased and brain dead. And as I mentioned before, brain dead basically means that you don't have a brain stem anymore. You'll never have independent thoughts or breaths or you're legally and ethically and, and uh, medically considered deceased. Uh, we sometimes see obituaries for the patients before we go and retrieve the organs. Um, there's another category. This is uh, um, These are donors that are not brain dead, but they're... Um, they're, they have an unsurvivable injury. Um, so in these cases, uh, they might allocate the organs uh, pending withdrawal of care at the family's wishes. Um, 
And what we do is we allocate the organs and we go to the donor hospital. And then um, we're allowed to give heparin and get the abdomen prepped for surgery, but we have no interaction with any of the decision-making regarding the death pronouncement. Um, basically, the person that would have withdrawn support with the family present upstairs in the ICU does the exact same procedure, but they do it in the operating room. And uh, the person's allowed to peacefully expire. And then we give an extra five minutes to make sure everybody's comfortable and that you know we haven't changed our minds. Um, and at which point the person is legally and medically and ethically deceased just like they were if they were brain dead, and we can go in and retrieve organs at that point. Um, and this is a very common procedure for kidneys, um, very common for livers. Uh, some programs use pancreases from these donors as well. So clearly we don't have enough organs for all the people who need them. And one of the major things is we don't have enough organ donors. How do we make that better? I think the, the most straightforward way is, is we have lots of mechanisms where you can become an organ donor. But I think the most important thing is start a dialogue with your family. Make sure your family knows what you would want to do. Um, you know, transplantation helps thousands of people a year. Uh, there are people who are dying waiting for organs. Um, and there's a lot of things people can do. Uh, you know, the, the, the time when somebody passes from a tragedy is, is always extremely painful. And one of the wonderful things about transplant is it does put a little bit of light in that moment and it does allow someone to live on. So I would encourage people to have conversations with their loved ones and honestly consider being an organ donor. This seems like one of those where a simple behavior economic trick could make such a big difference too. We, we make it that the default is not to be a donor and force people to actually say they're going to be a donor. Other countries do the opposite where your default, no, I mean, your default, a donor and you have to opt out, which again, everybody's right, but that would probably massively just increase the number of donors overnight. Why don't we do that? Well, it's made a huge difference in certain countries and their organ donation rate. Uh, but I think our, our default in our country is very reasonable that people have a right to decide what's sure. going to happen with their body. Um, but on the other hand, that just makes our job a little bit more difficult but we're up to the challenge. I think we have to educate people and make sure they're aware of what transplant can do and how transformative it could be. And, um, you know, I, I think the more people know about it, the more they interact with people who've had transplants, hopefully the more willing they'd be to donate their organs. Well, that's a perfect message, I think, to end on. So thank you. We're going to switch over to questions now. Question number one. I'm scared of bats. Why isn't the rabies vaccine widely available like the MMR or polio vaccine? So one, I'd argue that, I mean, you might have a different answer, there, but it's like, I, I'd argue, first of all, it's not nearly as common or infectious in the sense, you know, measles, you can catch just by being in the room. Rabies has a specific vector that you have to get bit by an animal that has rabies, which doesn't occur that often that this is something we want to do. Plus, it's a horrifically difficult and painful vaccination to go through. It's not like a take a shot while you're a baby and be done. So both, both from, I think, from an economic cost effective standpoint, and also probably from a how much pain is involved. It just doesn't seem like something we'd ever do. Does that sound right? I, I also hate bats. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't realize that the uh, Indiana brown bat is a protected species, and so you shouldn't just kill them and you shouldn't touch them. Um, so it's actually not a bad idea to get someone to get it out of your house if you have one. We've actually, I've, I've had to, we've removed multiple bats from, uh, from our house as a kid. I remember that. It was always sort of my dad in a, I picture him, and this will sound strange, but like in his underwear with like a, a helmet on going after the bat trying to catch is crazy. Anyway, uh, Adam and Kelly ask, I'll be soon starting medical school this summer and I'm very excited to eventually become a physician. My girlfriend is currently finishing her first year in nursing school and is equally excited to become a nurse. We really enjoyed the episode where Amy talked about her occupation as a nurse practitioner and it definitely opened our eyes to the diversity within the healthcare field. That's our goal. I'm thrilled. As a future doctor nurse couple, we were curious about the nature of your relationship. Was there ever any sort of power dynamic between you because of your different job titles? How did other people treat you as a doctor and a couple? Additionally, do you two enjoy discussing medical talk or do you prefer to avoid it? This is a perfect answer, a question for both of us uh, because John's wife is a oncologist, actually at, at another type of doctor at IU School of Medicine, so he can actually offer a different perspective. Um, it's interesting you ask this. Amy and I, I've often decided like we just should not be doing the same thing at the same time. Um, and so um, we've actually had a few instances where work has almost overlapped because she's clinically involved in some of my research. And I just don't, I don't know. I don't love it because there's a difference between work Aaron and home Aaron. And Amy will be the first person to point this out. And there's only been a few times I think she's actually interacted with work Aaron. And that's a different guy. And so I try to keep it separate. But there's no power dynamic in the house of that. I feel like I'm more knowledgeable or better in any way. Amy is a phenomenal um, primary care practitioner, and I'm a 
good researcher, I think. And I think I'm an adequate pediatrician. But to be honest with you, I defer to Amy on on many issues that would be just sort of primary care pediatrics because she's doing that every day. She's also incredibly knowledgeable about taking care of adolescents and about uh, uh, birth control issues because those are the things that she does um, every day. And so it's a different job. And I think most spouses have different jobs. And so it hasn't been much of an issue. You're you're both physicians, but why don't you answer the same question? Um, so my wife is actually also a transplanter, but she does bone marrow transplants. Um, and she works one floor above me, but we almost never bump into each other at the hospital. Um, we realized very early on in our careers that we probably shouldn't come home and talk about immunosuppression. Uh, so we actually talk shop very little. We talk medicine very little, uh, except when something's interesting. As far as uh, behaviors at home and power dynamic, I, I, I don't see a problem. We both approach issues very differently, me being a surgeon and her being an internist. I, I know we've been first responders to several things, and I'll usually walk by and I'll say that the person's breathing and I'll be relieved and wait for help to come because the only thing that I feel like I can do at the side of the road without someone handing me instruments is I, I can maybe provide an airway, whereas my wife will get an entire history and ask what medications they're on and ask about their past medical history and get all the information for the AMD and usually gets all the credit for everything. So. So, you know, so now I'm going to go to my question of my own, where it's um, my dad, uh, who is uh, retired, but he was a, a surgeon, um, used to travel and we would go on vacation with basically, I think, enough equipment to do an appendectomy. <laughs> like, I mean, he just everywhere he went, it was just a ridiculous. Like, I think he felt like he had to have. Do other surgeons do this or was he just crazy? Yeah, I, I do not do that. OK, good. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Because uh, I, I just just wonder, like, because I think feel like he could almost just on the side of the road do stuff because he was just he always had this equipment with him. It was crazy. Rachel asks, what's the latest thought on antibiotic ointments, polysporin, neosporin, et cetera? My dermatologist doesn't seem to recommend them anymore. Should I toss them all and replace them with plain old petroleum jelly? What does the science say? It depends what you're using them for. Um, you know, they clearly have a use in the treatment of localized topical infections. Uh, and um, I'd also argue that in some cases, uh, especially with my children, I have used them, you know, one time only type things uh, as placebo uh, in the sense that like, oh, my God, I have this hurts. And I think I even wrote about this recently. We might have even talked about this in an episode. Oh, it was the stents episode. Yeah. Like I'll put a little cream on and be like, this will take care of it. And they're going, yeah. And then it's over. And it's like, that's a very low cost, low risk way to, to care for many problems that I know are just going to go away. I wouldn't use them long term in that route because, of course, we don't want to overuse antibiotics uh, in any way. But um, I don't think that there's no use for them. It just may be that, that your dermatologist is getting a little more uh, discriminatory in what he or she is applying them for. So I wouldn't throw them away. Mm, of course, I mean, of course, if they're ten years old, I'm not sure if they'll they'll still work anymore. Um, but other than that, they I still think absolutely those things have a use. In fact, I know that there have been you know randomized controlled trials of even wound clearing or wound healing studies, which show that you know the use of such ointments with coverage works better than, of course, exposing things and letting dry them out. We've definitely talked about that in previous episodes. So um, I don't think that they are useless. You're a, you're a surgeon, though. How do you feel? Oh, how do I feel? Um, I think that. The transplant programs in most hospitals were the epicenter of resistant organisms. Um, so actually, we try very hard not to overuse antibiotics, right. but because of our immunosuppressed patient population, yep. we tend to use them a lot. Um, so I, I think my recommendation is if there's not a specific indication for an antibiotic, including an antibiotic ointment, uh, we, we try not to use them. You know, a lot of hospitals these days are using these uh, CHG baths to try to prevent line infections. And mm -hmm. we, we actually resisted that in transplant because we had that such, such a specific concern that we were going to breed out these resistant super bacteria in our patient populations. Hmm. All right. This is from No Name Attached. I don't usually take a multivitamin, but I'm pregnant, so I have to take a prenatal. How much of a difference is there between the $10 bottle at Costco and the $100 bottle at Whole Foods? I'm going to guess almost none. Um, and again, as long as it's a comprehensive multivitamin and it's got the folate that, that the doctors are going to recommend to you, yeah, then there's no difference whatsoever. You might as well save the money. I don't have a specific comment. I guess taking them is probably better than not taking them. And if yep. there's a difference between not taking them because it's too expensive or taking the $10, I, I can't imagine there'd be a difference. Yeah. And he says, one of the hardest parts of being vegan for the past six years is having to listen to the pseudoscience and quackery that gets bandied about the community. The last claim I've heard is that a whole foods plant-based diet can cure cancer. Some go so far as to discourage people from undergoing chemotherapy unless the individual has first switched to a 
whole food plant-based diet. Is there evidence demonstrating that this can indeed cure cancer? And if not, how do we combat the spread of that misinformation? No, I mean, no, no, there's no evidence that this cures cancer. Let's just start there. Um, in fact, I started, I'm pretty sure I started the beef chapter in my book with a discussion of, I can't remember the guy's name, but uh, it's the guy that started the macrobiotic diet who basically was making these kinds of claims. And of course, eventually he got I think it was lung cancer and died of uh, pancreatic cancer. Um, and he was like the original, wrote the book on the plant-based diet, and that's why it was going to cure cancer. So look, there are sometimes health reasons for changing your diet and everything else, but but no, um, there's no solid evidence that this kinds of thing cures cancer. Final question, and appropriate for the day. How often are those stories about, you know, getting knocked out in foreign countries and waking up in a bathtub of ice with your kidney missing because someone's going to transplant turn out to be true? I'm going to guess most of these are apocryphal. I don't think there are roving bands, especially I would imagine, especially in the United States, there are plenty of legal and legitimate ways for people to get organs. And I think that these studies are, are I mean, these kinds of stories are much more scary than they are real. You know, it's 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 a it's a black market that we're discussing here, and uh, so it would be impossible to guess how frequently it occurs. I, I think much more often than much more oftenly occurring than the uh, waking up in the bathtub with your kidney stolen would be um, people who are coerced into donating organs, uh, people who don't have a cent to their name and are offered a small amount of money for a kidney, and uh, that's illegal behavior in the United States. That is a perfect note to end on. John, I can't thank you enough. This has been fascinating. Um, as thank you, I mean, as always, thanks so much for appearing. I'm, I'm sure we could bring you back in the future and we have more specific questions, but this has been absolutely a pleasure. Um, a little housekeeping as we close. Please remember, as always, go to healthcaretriage.info to get your questions in for the next episode. Again, that's healthcaretriage.info. Um, as always, we'd appreciate any support for the show that you can do. Patreon.com is a great way for you, the listener, to support the show in any way you can even if it's just a dollar a month. And if you don't want to, that's fine. The show will always be free. But if you're interested, patreon.com slash healthcare triage. Again, that's patreon.com slash healthcare triage. You can get all your great healthcare triage merch at hctmerch.com. Once more, hctmerch.com. And I mentioned a few times in this episode, but if you're interested, my new book, The Bad Food Bible, is still available in stores. I'd appreciate it if you pick up a copy. We will see you next episode, or you will hear us next episode.